Uh, and I think that's all. So with this, I leave you to Neil Lambert, who will be telling us about supergravity. Hi. Right. Well, thanks everyone for coming, especially those of you who came from outside King's College. Um, so I, I, it, I look forward to these lectures. I, I thought a little bit about how to do it. I recently, well, my wife recently moved to Brussels, and I was looking at all this architecture, and I was always inspired by this sort of fin de siècle European um, uh, architecture and joie de vivre, or whatever words you want to put in, uh, about things at the turn of the 18th to 19th century. And then I was asked to give these lectures, and I thought, what do I want to put into these lectures? And I got a list of topics, and I realized this is supergravity as it was understood in 1996, more or less. Right? So it's, it's another turn of the century. A hundred years later, uh, not as romantic, um, but that's sort of the scope of supergravity that I'm going to talk about. Now, why? Well, I think it, that's not to say it's, 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 that was supergravity's prime. Supergravity is a big subject. It's, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So one thing, for example, it might mean would be if you're a phenomenologist and you were looking at uh, embedding the standard model of particle physics into the minimal supersymmetric standard particle model, uh, minim, MSSM, let's just say, the minimal supersymmetric standard model. And then you would want to, to couple that to gravity, and you, the people use any. So there you're looking at four dimensions, and you're looking at minimal supergravity. So one super, one supercharge, one spinorial supercharge. Uh, and then you might look at how you break that and use it for effective field theory for the standard model. That is not what we're going to touch. We're not going to come within 100 miles of that kind of supergravity. The supergravity I'm going to talk about is the supergravity that's relevant for string theory and M theory. So primarily, we're going to be looking at 10 and well, probably exclusively, we're going to be looking at 10 and 11 dimensions. But I will try to be as general as possible about how things work. So one of the fidgety things about anything supersymmetric, and certainly supergravity uh, falls into this problem, is that the spinner conventions are heavily dependent upon the dimension you're in. Spinner conventions sorry, are heavily dependent upon the dimension you are in. And it can get very fidgety if you've got symplectic Majorana spinners in six dimensions or something, and you've got these formulas, and they're not quite the same formulas that they were in four dimensions, although they're conceptually the same formula and all this kind of stuff. So um, well, let me put in a... Now, I think that's how you spell it. So we should be mainly interested in d equals 10 or 11. But I will keep d general, just because I can. Yeah. Um, so of course, 11 is relevant for M theory, 10 for uh, string theory. And you could do a lot of things in other dimensions, but I, I'm, not, I'm not planning to do that. I'm planning to stay there. Um, some conventions, because it, it is tricky, uh, it, as I was complaining about it, but in 10 or 11 dimensions, I'm going to take spinners to be real. And so are the gammas. That's just to make our lives simpler. Yeah. And it's true. In 10 and 11 dimensions, I can get away with that. In 8 and 9, I can't. In 7, no. 6, no. 5, no. 4, yes. 3, yes. 2, yes. Um, that it'll, it, and also, if you do gauge theories, it's not always convenient to have real supersymmetries. But we're not going to be doing gauge theories, so at least not much. So, and for supergravity, I think simple real spinners are, are, are the best. So uh, a rough plan. And it's very rough, because um, I, I started writing these. I was quite happy to do these lectures. I thought, oh, it's fine. It'll be, it'll be nice. I, got, I very enthusiastically sat down, I think, in August and wrote a couple of lectures or somewhat. And then I've dropped it since <laughs> uh, other things have taken over. Plus, I don't want to write the whole course and find out that it's not quite what's needed. So this is what I'm planning. And well, 
you know, life has a way of not listening to your plans. But this is what I want to do. So I'm going to start off with some basics. And these are sort of tools. So we want to know about the Fieldbein formulation. Fieldbeins and spin connection. And I'll put it in here, differential forms. Is that, I can still write at that level? It's OK. So this is just some basic mathematics, which, and I'm sure some of you, and well, I know some of you, are actually already very familiar with these topics. But I I'm, I'm don't want to assume that everybody is. And then after we do some field binds, spin connections, differential forms, and all that, uh, the main idea is just to write down an elementary supergravity. The most basic thing we could write down that does what it says on the box, which is a supersymmetric theory of gravity. The other thing I've decided to do, and it's definitely a good idea given that I'm working on a blackboard, is I'm going to be not writing down the higher order fermion stuff. <laughs> Supergravity theories, they start with the Einstein-Hilbert action, and then you add a fermionic term for the gravitinos. And elementary supergravity, we will do that, and we will see how it works up to linear order in the fermions when you vary the action. But there will be cubic order fermion terms, and then even quintic, and what have you. And these terms are horrible. And above four dimensions, and up from four dimensions and above, these terms are really horrible. And I wouldn't even be able to fit them on this board, pretty much, unless I introduce us to notation. And it's not particularly insightful, I have to say. I mean, thank you to all the people who actually did the hard work when they constructed supergravity theories, because um, of course it's critical that those terms vanish, but they are notoriously complicated and difficult. And so we're just never going to really address that at all in these lectures. In fact, we're not even going to address fermions very much at all once we go beyond this. Because the great irony of super, supergravity is, is supergravity theories are constrained by the existence of supersymmetry. It's heavily constraining on them. And it gives up these weird, or at least naively weird, bosonic actions which have supersymmetric completions with fermions. But almost every paper you'll ever read on supergravity will just set the fermions to zero. <laughs> so you need them to set up the bosonic sector. And of course, you need them for various things. But in most of the literature, uh, you're just looking at the bosonic part of supergravity. So, and I'll do that here, simply because there's, just, there's no way to handle the, the full uh, fermionic sector in its full glory. So that's, roughly speaking, that's what I'm hoping to do today. The next week, I thought we would start looking at 10D and 11D and their solutions. So we'll specialize a bit. And their BPS solutions. So these are soups. These are solutions which preserve some supersymmetry. We'll come down to what that is. Um, and there's various things here. So uh, special holonomy manifolds. I won't talk too much about special holonomy manifolds, because that could be its own lecture series, frankly. Um, so here we're talking about things like Calabi-Yau manifolds. But there we will talk about M2 brains and M5 brains in d equals 11. I was planning to talk about them in fairly some detail, construct their solutions and show you how it works. Uh, because what you do, this is all, that's an 11D. And to get to 10D, you simply dimensionally, well, to get to one form of 10D, you simply dimensionally reduce. So these are the relatively simple solutions in 11 dimensions. And then we will apply them to 10 dimensions. Um, and one of the things we want to discuss here also is, is non-perturbative stability. This is probably not legible, but so there's this, these forms of proofs that are based on uh, um, an old 
proof by Witten of the positive mass theorem in general relativity. So this was, oh, I'll talk about that when, I, when we get to it, but uh, you can adapt Witten's proof for positive mass, that which is to say that if you start with a, a space-time in four dimensions, or any, but in four dimensions, and it has a smooth spatial uh, cross-section, it won't produce a negative mass uh, solution, like negative mass Schwarzschild can't be created, evolved. It sounds obvious, but it actually took a long time to prove it, first proved by, by Keichel, by Yao, and then Witten produced this beautiful proof using super, inspired by supersymmetry, which you can then adapt to show uh, that these solutions are stable, yeah. non perturbatively stable. And it's an analog of the BPS argument, or the Bogomoni argument, but in supergravity. I don't know if this is going to be week one and week two. I don't know if this is going to be week one and two and three. <laughs> Or, or if this is going to be the whole. I hope. I hope this isn't all of today because I haven't quite got the details all down on that yet. Um, the third topic would be um, dimensional reduction and U duality. So here, that's the reason why I'm starting with the M2, the M2 and M5 brains is A, they're, they're kind of the nicest, well, I guess it's personal, but they're simpler, in my opinion, than the other. And then you, you get the others by dimensionally reducing these, and that gives you uh, the string theories. And then if you go down on further tori, you get rather remarkable, exceptional groups. Symmetry groups. And this is a source of fascination to several people, myself included. Why the hell is it that if you take this theory, which is just this bosonic theory that you've written down in 11 dimensions based on supersymmetry and gravity, if you, if you put it on a torus, you get things like, well, if you like, you can get anything from E8, E7, E6, uh, SO10, which if you're esoteric enough, you just call E5, uh, SL5. SU3 times SU2, um, which you some, and there's sometimes you call it E4 and sometimes you call it E3, and finally SU2, SL2. These groups start appearing, and it's, they come out of nowhere from a supergravity point of view, and these are related to the U dualities in space time. Um, I don't know if I get a chance to show you how that happens. I would do it. To me, it still just pops out of thin air. It's really um, a miracle, <laughs> if you like. OK. But anyway, that's, that's what I thought of doing. Let's see what we actually wind up doing. Hmm? Are there any comments on these? Uh, so this. But by the way, there's also, if I go left, um, it's a series, it's a finite series. Well, I guess it's infinite going that way, but it appears in many, this series of groups appears in, or algebras, it's more like the algebras play a role. Uh, it, it, it appears in several contexts in mathematics and physics. So E1 is SL2, E3 is, SL2, and so you just, it's the exceptional series. It's just a name. Um, but it, it, it's, it shows up in supergravity. It also shows up in complex geometry. If you look at singularities of, of, of Calabiales and things like, of cones and Calabiales, blow ups of things, you get these, these groups appearing. Um, so there are, there are a special magical list of groups, algebras, I should say, that, that nature seems to be. Well, physics is churning out repeatedly under different circumstances. Um, yeah. OK. I can't remember the last time I rubbed off a blackboard. It's nice.
So I'm going to begin, and you know, feel free to interrupt me or uh, yawn very loudly if you think this is too trivial. So let's start. So first of all, what, what, why is supergravity is basically local supersymmetry. That's one way to think about it. Of course, it, it's a theory that's supergravity, meaning that, that, that it's gravity with a superpartner. But why do we expect to, do, to see something like that? Um, so let's consider a rigid supersymmetry. Consider rigid. I'm going to write SUSI. So I've got some field. I don't care what it is, but it's bosonic. And bosons always transform into, fo into fermions like so. Oh, By the way, I'm going to, as I told you in my conventions that I'm thinking about all the spinners being real, and uh, hence this is just gamma transpose gamma zero. Um, so here, gamma zero has a dual role because you have that gamma mu transpose, sorry, dagger. You always have this. So, in, in, of course, this is an eta. This is what the gamma matrices do for you. And you can always choose a representation which the gamma zero is anti-Hermitian and the gamma spatial gamma i's are Hermitian. And that's encapsulated by this equation. Turns out you can always find a C matrix. So that's something similar. Uh, for the transpose, but since I'm taking them to be real, C and gamma zero can be taken to be the same thing. So I'm going to take C to be gamma zero. All right. So this is bog standard supersymmetry. The variation of a boson is epsilon times a fermion. A variation of a fermion is some gammas derivative. I just call that normal derivative. And this is a phi. Yeah. That's bog standard supersymmetry. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, if you look at the commutator of these two things, you're going to get something like the following. I'm just doing it on the bosons. Trust everyone's sort of done this calculation. So if you have an interacting theory, there might be more stuff down on the bottom here. Yeah? And this is the stuff that always determines what your interactions are, in fact. Yeah. So you, but you, at least the lowest order in, in, in derivatives and such, uh, you, you never really adjust the first line. If supersymmetry is always the variation of a boson is epsilon times a fermion. The variation of a fermion is a derivative of a boson plus interacting stuff. So this is going to have also plus dot, dot, dots, depending on your theory. And in, yeah, especially in maximally supersymmetric theories, what you write here determines the theory. OK. So if you work this out, um, it's just some vector v mu d mu phi. And it turns out it's just this epsilon bar. 2 gamma mu epsilon 1. So this is, of course, this is the famous statement that everyone knows, that supersymmetry closes onto translations. Yeah. So more abstractly, you have a spinorial generator Q alpha, Q beta. I haven't written alpha and beta indices, and I'm going to try to avoid writing alpha and beta indices, but they are the ones that sit on the spinners. So this guy, for example, has an alpha downstairs and a beta upstairs. 
and epsilon is epsilon downstairs. So abstractly, this becomes simply uh, two C inverse gamma mu uh, P mu. And yeah, if I put the indices on, and I'll put them on for now, but it'll be alpha beta. So C is gamma zero for us. and. Uh, C is to spinners what eta is to vectors. Are you happy with that? Right? It's the metric. So you use gamma, eta mu nu is what you, you use to raise and lower vector-like indices, um, like a partial derivative or gamma mu index. And C, well, C is, a, the way I've written it, C would be C alpha beta upstairs. And C inverse would be downstairs. And C is, C is raising um, spinner indices, such that this contraction, where have I got it? Here. That guy is going to be Lorentz invariant. It's a scalar, in fact. Yeah. So C is to spinners, alpha indices, what eta is to vector indices. And that's the algebra that, that corresponds to this translation. So the point is, if I wanted to make supersymmetry local, so my epsilon is now going to be an epsilon of x. Oh. Um, there's a question. Um, with the C, can you say anything about the symmetry properties in the alpha beta indices? It's symmetric. It's what? It's a very good question, and it depends on what you're talking about. In terms of the symmetry of C. Yeah, but so is C? So C is anti-symmetric, yeah. typically. Again, I don't know. There might be a dimension. <laughs> so C always exists. So you have this algebra, and what you can prove is, at, at least in even dimensions, you can prove that up to conjugacy, there is a unique representation of this matrix. And it's in terms, of, it's by 2 to the d over 2 by 2 to the d over 2 matrices. Yeah? That's a theorem in even dimensions. Um, so it's unique in even dimensions. So it's also easy to see that if the gamma mu satisfy this, so do the gamma mu daggers. So there must be a conjugation matrix that relates them to your original choice. That's why you know this one exists. But actually, this is just this familiar statement that um, gamma 0 squares to minus 1 is anti-hemission, and the spatial gamma is squared to 1, and they're hemission. But you also know that if you took the transpose of this, you'd satisfy it. So you know that there's another matrix C. And you also know, if you, by the way, if you took star of this, you'd satisfy it. So there must be a matrix B, such that gamma mu star is minus B gamma mu. Anyway. Similar. So you know those matrices exist. Whether or not they're symmetric or anti-symmetric, real or pure imaginary is typically the case. That can be dimension dependent. For the dimensions I'm talking about, C is just gamma zero, which we've taken to be real and anti-symmetric. But again, your mileage may vary. If you go to eight dimensions, you, would find some, you might find something different. And that's the whole bit why spinners are so tricky. It's, a lot of things depend on whether or not C is symmetric or anti-symmetric, real or anti -symmetric. OK. Um, right, so what's going to happen now? We're going to let epsilon be local. So if epsilon is local, then V will be local, meaning it's going to be V of x. Um, so let's think about this, this. This transformation we found here is delta phi is phi plus v mu d mu phi. And actually, what you really want to think of that is, is phi um, of x transforms, if you like, to phi of x plus v, which is phi of x. So the transformation you're getting is a translation, but if this becomes v of x, then this is, looks like a diffeomorphism. Oh, sorry, x mu to first order. So once we allow for local supersymmetry, we have to include diffeomorphisms. 
So now we have to have, uh, presumably we have different morphism invariant theory, we have to have a metric. That metric has to transform because this is a diffeomorphism, so you know how it transforms. So the metric is not invariant under supersymmetry. Well, generically. Of course, you can do something else. You can take a supersymmetric theory and put it on a curved manifold and not have, gravi not have dynamical gravity. But then you won't have arbitrary epsilons that, that, that will uh, generate supersymmetry. They will have to be epsilons that preserve symmetries of the metric, killing spinners. <coughs> So hence we have, uh, well, for generic epsilon alpha of x, uh, g mu nu will transform. So that's why we need to have gravity. So let's make our guess. We want a theory of gravity and supersymmetry. So what's our guess? Delta G mu nu, well, it's a guess. So I'm just going to put roughly, what would you expect? Well, it's this, this story with, uh, it's going to be epsilon times a boson. And maybe I can put a gamma matrix in there. Fine. I can't put the gamma mu nu because that's anti-symmetric. So that's not going to work. And I can't put gamma symmetrized because that just gives me eta mu nu. And that's not going to be good enough. That will just be the conformal factor. So I have to dream up something like this. I have to put a new index on my fermion. And then I can make it symmetric. OK, so in order to have a dynamical theory of supergravity, I need to introduce these guys, which are going to call, be called the gravitinos. And they're some kind of spinner index that also has a vector index. It's a spin 3 half field if you, if, in, in, in other language. OK, so then I have to postulate how psi mu changes. And well, the natural thing to write down is simply d mu epsilon. It's just a derivative of epsilon. All right. so. That's what we think a supergravity is going to look like. But what I want to do now is spend a bit of time, because what does this mean? How do I define a covariant derivative of a spinner? That's my next task. Yeah. Are there any questions? So that's another thing I have. I, I was assuming you wouldn't pick up on that. So yeah, these gamma matrices will be gamma matrices for curved space time. So you would expect them to satisfy something like this. And that's actually, we'll come back to that in five, 10 minutes. OK. So. This motivates our next topic, which is we have to introduce so-called field binds. All right. So let's consider Lorentz transformations.
R D or R one comma D minus one. Just we're still not we're still in flat space. Every, we know how everything works there. A Lorentz transformation infinitesimally is some kind of rotation like that, right? And uh, the only thing you would have is that if you lowered the indices, you get that. So that preserves the inner product. And a, in fact, a generic vector, right, is always going to be. And I'm assuming you know that if you have flat space, then a spinner transforms like the following. So this is special relativity. This is what you need to know for, the, say, the Dirac equation. Yeah. You have a Lorentz transformation. It acts on any vector like that, which, but it acts on a spinner like this. And the reason is that <coughs> well, we put it this way: a half here and a half here. These satisfy the Lorentz algebra. So if I were to call these things m mu nu, m lambda rho, you're going to get things like i eta nu lambda eta mu rho plus, and then there's going to be three more terms for antisymmetry. Antisymmetric in mu nu, lambda rho. Yeah? This is the important thing about gamma matrices, right? Is that if you take the antisymmetric pro pro property and a factor of a half, you find a representation of the Lorentz algebra. Right? The factor of a half is, is important, because um, that's ultimately why fermions, when you go around 2 pi, pick up a minus sign. And the factor of a half here is just the overcounting, because mu nu is the same as nu lambda. So this, this is actually 1 half lambda mu nu, sorry, m mu nu psi. OK, so are you happy with this? This is just, this is how fermion turns. And this is flat space. We're in flat space. Please. Uh, the factor of i's? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm bluffing, because I, I didn't put it in my notes. So. Here? Yeah, um, I'm now, I'm, I might be off by the eyes. So, so let me just think for a second. No, this, I think this is correct, because I've checked this much. The question is, um, yeah, that there might be, what, what I should probably do is put an I here, and hence I want minus I's here. That, that's probably going to do it for me. And then, yeah, now I'm good. Thanks, yeah. But this is the key thing. That's what happens to a fermion in flat space under a Lorentz transformation. So what we want to do is we want to come up with a system which allows us to take flat space, which, for example, the tangent space in the manifold is a flat space. So you could define this in the tangent space of a manifold at a point. And then we want to bring that down to the manifold. And that's basically what field binds do. So we're field bind. And the word field bind, if I'm not mistaken, means many legs. Right? Are there any German speakers? So it's many legs. And sometimes you'll see it as an Einbein in one dimension. That's one leg. A Zweibein, two legs. A Vierbein in four dimensions, uh, four legs. That's what this thing means. But yeah, if field bind is the generic term, even if it only has one leg. Uh, so that's something like the following. E mu nu. And I'm going to put an underline. It's an un this is an unpopular convention. But I'm going to try to convince you why it's good. 
What does it do? You want sorry, to write g mu nu as e mu rho e nu lambda eta rho lambda. That's what the field bind does. The idea of the field bind is it's got one leg in space time, if you like, and one leg in the tangent space. Or one arm, I don't know what you're call it. Uh, so x mu's are coordinates on the manifold. You have some open patch. What are the new underlines? So the new underlines also range in the same direction, dimension 0 to d minus 1. I've put an underline, and I'll, I'll tell you why. It's often you might see it with an A index. Yeah? That's, this is the way more common use in literature. And I agree it's much prettier. Uh, but I like to put the new bar, new underline, for two reasons. One, it seems a shame to introduce a yet another index which has exactly the same range as mu. Right? And, and if, if you have a, a theory where we've got alpha as the spinner index, mu is the space-time index, and now I've got an A as some other tangent space index. This is called the tangent space index. Um, and then maybe you've got a gauge field, so there's a Lie algebra index, and you've got all these indices. Now, this guy is just, he's the tangent space version of the coordinate frame mu. So I put an underline on it. And the other reason is, uh, if you actually start working with explicit solutions, um, and we will see that you might have a vector field, and there's a vector field v mu, or there's a vector field v mu bar, well, that's clear. You know what you're talking about. Or if you're talking about the first component, then you know the first component. Whereas if I use the other notation, v mu and v a, and if I want to write down what v1 is, then I don't know which frame I'm in. Yeah? And this caused me almost to kill Peter West. Uh, because he wrote a paper, which I will quote later on, in which I couldn't reproduce until I realized <laughs> All his, well, actually, half of his coordinates were in one frame, and the other half were in the other. Uh, but there was no notation to, s to single out between them. OK. So uh, that's what we're introducing this guy, e mu nu bar, nu underline. And this is its job in life. It's, if you like, the square root of the metric tensor. But it's, what its real job is, is it's taking the, um, the tangent bundle, as they say at the time, and, and, and mapping, which is, which is just Rd, and, and mapping it to the manifold. And this index is a curved index, sometimes called a world, world index. And this is called the tangent index. It's not hard to see that you can always find an E. Because it's got more, there are more degrees of freedom in E than there are in G, right? It has D squared components. G mu nu, because it's symmetric actually has d, d plus 1 over 2. So it's, there are more e's than there are g's. But what happens is it's easy to see that if you have that, Then I will always find another solution. Uh, where 
E prime mu lambda is some, what do I put here? Put it. Uh, oh, I rushed ahead of my notes. This could be a function of x. This is a Lorentz trans. Well, this is a Lorentz transformation, a local Lorentz transformation. Local because it depends on x. And Lorentz, because it does what we expect a Lorentz transformation to do, it leaves. Um, The met eta invariant. Uh, tau. Yeah. So you have this local Lorentz uh, symmetry, if you like, built in. You can e is only defined up to a local Lorentz transformation, a rotation by a lambda, which preserves eta. But this lambda can depend on x. So you're kind of like gauging the Lorentz group. All right. Um, <laughs> so that's what E does. Uh, Sometimes you see it written like this, by the way, in a sort of an index-free notation. If I think of matrix multiplication, this is E times eta, but then actually it's the transpose on the right-hand side, right? if you look at the way the indices are contracting. So sometimes you might see it like that. Um, so it's easy to see, of course, that assuming g is invertible, e is going to be invertible, right? Because the determinant of g is the determinant of e squared. So we can have an inverse e, and it's got the same name as traditional, and then you swap the indices around a bit, so it would be lambda downstairs and mu upstairs, and it would have the property what? Well, e lambda mu e mu rho delta lambda rho and also you could do it the other way around e mu rho e rho nu is uh, delta mu nu and these guys as I sort of alluded to earlier allow you to convert so you might have um, a vector field v mu and then you can write this as, uh, well, I guess I've done it not the way I want it. Mu lambda bar v lambda bar. Conversely, v lambda bar is e uh, v uh, mu mu lambda. And so you can swap between things that you're more familiar with, this is a vector living on the manifold with a vector living in the tangent space, if you like. This e frame. Yeah. And this is what I was saying, why it's sometimes it's useful to have the bar index, because you know wh where it's living, <laughs> the underlying index. OK. But I, I, here's a word of caution, because I see this mistake even in published papers or papers that attempt to be published, is that if E mu nu bar is dy nu bar by dx nu for some functions y nu. So suppose there are some functions y nu of x, such that e mu nu bar is dy nu by dx mu. Yeah? 
Suppose such functions existed. Then what? Then G mu nu. Actually, no, let me write not G mu nu so much, but ds squared. This is G mu nu. But this just becomes So you have flat space. Okay. So this is really not ever true. I mean, it might be. <laughs> you would be in flat space. Uh, but don't think of it this way. Yeah. It's, in fact, these are sometimes they're not called free brains, they're called non coordinate frames. So, uh, and that's because there isn't a Y for which this is true. Otherwise, you're just talking about flat space in a very complicated, perhaps in a very complicated way. OK. And also, sometimes it's helpful to move all your formulas into the transverse space, so into the tangent space. So you're talking about the underlined indices. So also, you might have this object. Um, I don't know. Maybe you call it this. But this is not a derivative. <laughs> well, it depends what you mean. It's, 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 it's some functions times derivatives. So it's not a simple derivative. So this is another bit of warning. So in particular, they don't commute. So sometimes it is useful to go to this frame, but you have to then remember that if you do that, these are not just derivatives, so they're not going to commute. OK. So So we can think. Of emu as a one form. So I'm going to describe forms in a minute. But I wanted to mention uh, how many people know forms? Well, a good number, but not everyone. So to bear with it. So you can think of it as e nu as e mu e nu dx mu. You can think of it as a form field, a form that takes values in the tangent space. All right, so we'll come back to this because I do want uh, not every, some people didn't aren't familiar with forms and forms. You can live without knowing about forms, I suppose, but it's very much helpful if you do know. Yeah. Just a question: For which kind of uh, matrix uh, the derivatives in tangent space commute? Sorry. For which kind of matrix the derivatives in tangent space do commute? Do commute? I, 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 basically, only if it's flat space. I think so. I think, they think if this was to commute, that would mean that you, would, you could find the y's that I talked about on the other side. I think that's the case. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but certain, certainly if there are y's, then this, they will commute. OK. All right, so now we're going to switch everything in terms of uh, the e's, the field binds. And we wanted to find a derivative. So we have the Levi Civita connection. And on, on our friend, the metric tensor. You introduce the Christoffel symbols, and every index 
gets contracted with a suitable Christoffel symbol. No. Mu rho g uh, sigma. That's right, lambda sigma. And of course, this Christoffel symbols are usually taken to be symmetric. That's the Levi Civita connection. And of course, the great point is that this is zero. So we want to come up with something similar for E. So so we put the normal derivative there. There is a world in the C, so we're going to give it its own gamma matrix, Christoffel symbol, excuse me, not gamma matrix. And then we have to do something with the new index, because you know, if you're a physicist and you see an index, you contract it with something. So, omega, lambda, rho, e, rho, mu. Now we want this to be taken care of local Lorentz. And it's a connection, local Lorentz connection. It's actually, it's going to be, it's the spin connection. Or at least it leads to the spin connection. But for now it's just acting on a field bind. And of course we want this to be zero. If we want to recover the normal Levi-Civita connection, that had the feature that it was symmetric in mu nu. So we're going to demand the same sort of thing here. Sorry. So that gives us the following equation. So this is now just an equation for omega, and it's enough to solve for omega. I, sorry, I forgot to mention one other thing. So it takes values in the Lie algebra of Lorentz group of SO1 d minus 1. So that's, if you were to, say, raise both its indices, it would be anti-symmetric. So you get this rather nasty looking equation. If you're familiar with differential forms, and we will be doing it in a minute, I'm just trying to motivate why you would be interested in differential forms. These equations have much simpler meanings. This is simply dE lambda plus omega lambda rho wedge E rho equals zero, if you know differential forms, which you will surely. So this is the analogous uh, thing to how you define levi civita connection. And so there's a formula, by the way. You can solve this. There's a formula. And I'm going to write down the formula. I have to admit, personally, I don't find the formula very useful. <laughs> I find it more useful given a solution, given a particular metric, just to write down these equations and just to solve them, because they're typically not that bad. 
Well, and maybe. Ah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so there meant to be a new in the top right. Top. Top right. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Good. We're paying attention. So there is a formula, and I'll just I just write it down to you to show you that it exists. And actually, if you probably, and I'm I'm too old for this, but if you, you guys probably do, you probably just put this on Mathematica, and then you'd want this formula, not 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 like guess, <laughs> which is my approach to life. Um, so this the formula is that it's two e nu anti-symmetrized on lambda because you have to, so it's easiest to write it with both indices up d mu e nu rho and you anti-symmetrize in the bottom indices and lambda in rho and then minus e nu lambda e rho sigma anti-symmetrized on lambda and rho E mu tau D nu E sigma tau. So I've got lecture notes, by the way, which I will happily distribute or put on my way or something. If, so if you don't have to, to worry about <laughs> what I've written in this particular corner of the board, I just this is uh, an existence proof. This I claim solves that, and you're done. It's just like the formula you have for the Christoffel symbols, except that, like I said, I really don't find it very useful. It's not anti symmetric. It, it, so it, it's anti symmetric in this. Uh, I mean, the beautiful connection is always yours, right? If we, uh, if we wanted, uh, like, like for Christoffel to be symmetric, but in particular it's not required, right? Uh, anti symmetric in lambda rho? Yeah. You no, know, it's very important it's anti symmetric in lambda rho. Uh, because it, it, this is the statement that it's. It, it's, it's, so it's a connection, so you, and it's much more closely related to like a non-abelian connection of gauge theory than perhaps it is to geometry, um, the normal Christoffel. So this is telling you that it's living in the Lie algebra of, 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 of the Lorentz group, and hence it's going to preserve inner products. If this wasn't anti-symmetric, there would be lots, lots of things would go wrong. It would no longer be preserving um, inner products. Yeah, yeah, so question ah. is that normally for, uh, for the gamma mu, mu, okay, we also uh, want it symmetric, but it's not like, required, right? Sometimes it's, it's not. And uh, the, then it yes. comes also that spin connection, it's uh, when we don't require. I'll tell you what, so that, that does motivate, that, that's the, actually literally the next thing I was going to say, I think. Uh, so we have this formula. Um, And this equation, which I've written here, but it's literally the same equation as this equation, right? That's why we're learning forms, is because you could write this equation, or you could just write it like this if you know forms, which we will discuss after in a second. So either way, this is saying that it's, anti it's, symmet it's symmetric in the lower indices, yeah? That's because this is the anti-symmetric part. This is the torsion. In general, you may not require that. The Levi-Civita connection is the unique metric connection that is, uh, annihilates the, the, the metric and has torsion-free, meaning, well, in the classic language, that gamma with downstairs indices is symmetric. Here, it's a new object, uh, the torsion, and you can imagine it's not zero. And in many examples, and actually, generically, in supergravity, it isn't zero. Generically, in supergravity, torsion appears. And torsion is given by some quadratic quick formula in the fermions. So actually, in supergravity, you don't have this equation. Well, you have this equation with the T given by fermions. But we're going to avoid that. Um, it won't be necessary for us. But it is a very important ingredient. If, if you do delve deeper into how supergravity theories are constructed, you will see um, that torsion comes up a lot. And actually, I should have said that a great book uh, to learn is this Van Proyen and uh, 
uh, Friedman book. They go into all these gory details. There's also other books. Peter West has a book. But the, the, the one that I think is, is most modern now is, is the Van Proyen one. Um, and Thomas Artan has a book. OK. What's the deal? Did you want, do we take breaks or we just keep going? Yeah. Take a break? OK. Oh, can I say one last thing? I have a short exercise is convince yourself that the gamma I've written here is indeed the Levy, like the formula for it is the same as the Levy Chivita connection formula. Yeah. So, and you actually you don't need to do a long calculation. You just have to think about the fact that, that I've got this equation and I can write G in terms of the E's. And if G is, so I can, so therefore I know what the covariant derivative of G is, and you will see that it reduces to the same thing for this. Because I, I've defined things differently, right? All I've assumed was that the gamma was, anti -symmet was symmetric, and I wrote this equation down. It's another thing to show that it is indeed the usual formula. And then, of course, th this helps with uh, uh, if you know if you know that this is gamma, then you can plug that into this equation, and that helps you read off what omega is, which is going to give you what this equation is that I that down here. Yeah, but to, to realize that this is the same old friend that you knew before is not that hard, because you just have to show that you just think about the fact that. That's zero, because this is true. OK. Well, thank you for your comments. Uh, the good news is I feel like I'm getting lots of questions, so maybe the pace is OK. Uh, I apologize if it's not. Uh, one thing I forgot to write in my notes, but I should mention, uh, I've been encouraged to go here, but you can't fit any equations on this. Uh, so we have, remember, So then we add the normal levi civita bit. And then we have the spin connection bit. Uh, there's a mu, and then there's a lambda, and rho downstairs. Oh, oh no, no, there's no line there. OK. So you know that gamma is not a tensor, right? It's a connection. And it transforms as a tensorial part plus an inhomogeneous transformation. Similarly, uh, omega isn't a tensor either. It transforms. I, I, I'm going to just be schematic. Um, so gamma will go to a tensor bit plus an inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous bit, excuse me two derivatives. Uh, omega also transforms as an inhomogeneous bit, so something like d d by dx, and then d by dx. Inverse, well, so something like that, plus the tensorial transformation rotation. OK. So these guys, this is two. Too rough, I apologize. So I just want to emphasize these guys are not tensors, right? But they have a normal thing that you'd expect. And this, this guy behaves just like, if you, if you know gauge theory, this is really a one form, like a covariant derivative, uh, an amu, a gluon, <laughs> which takes values in the group SO, whatever, 1, D minus 1. It, the structure is very much just like that of a gauge theory. OK. So let's, let's look at, at, at differential forms. I could do everything without mentioning differential forms. But as you can see, a lot of the formulas are really, really cleaned up by having the concept of a differential form. And a differential form Um, I've got R form. So you pick a number starting from 0, 1, 0 up. 
is, is, a, it's, is it's a zero R tensor it's, that is totally gently symmetric. Anti-symmetric. So you have something like the following, mu1 to mu r all downstairs indices. That's what it means to be 0 r all downstairs. And then totally antisymmetric means that it's equal to any equal up to sign up to any, perm any permutation, if you like, of its indices. In a form, you would usually write as the following object omega is, and then in my conventions, which I think are most people's conventions, you put a 1 over r factorial, and then you have omega mu 1 to mu r, and then you have the following thing, dx mu 1 wedge product dx mu r. So what do I mean by this mysterious wedge project, if, wedge project, product, if you haven't seen it already? It's just a tensor product that's totally antisymmetrized. So you just take tensor products and all cyclic commutations with signs, right? So if it's an even permutation, you get a plus sign. If it's an odd permutation, it's a minus sign. It's just constructed to be totally antisymmetric. Yeah. And the wedge product, well, that's the wedge product, if you like, defined on these coordinates. But more generally, you can just uh, take any two forms, an R form and an S form, And you just sort of multiply them together. So what would this be? Mu1 to mu r, and then uh, rho mu1 to mu s. And then this was dx mu1 wedge dx mu r. And now I'm wedge, product wedge producting it, which just means that I totally antisymmetrize again. So this is explicitly uh, right. I've just taken this definition here, and with this abstract notion, it's just totally anti. You know, it's just it's something that sits in the tensor product, but it's constructed to be anti-symmetric in the appropriate way. So if omega is this omega with the r factorial and this one, and then rho is got an s factorial, rho nu one to nu s, and then this guy. That's what I get, and then you just sort of re-expand everything out, and this would be an r plus s form. So this is what you mean, if you like, by it. so it goes all the way to mu to r one, mu to r s, and. Actually, no. I'm going to write like that. Mu r and then mu r plus 1 and all the way to mu r plus s. And then you just wedge product all the way um, to mu r plus s. So you just have to symmetrize everything. Yep. And if you like, in uh, If you want a formula, this is just what the components of the wedge product look like. Well, I'm just going to multiply up. I, so I just, this r plus s factorial cancels that r plus s factorial, r factorial, s factorial, that's that over there. And then you just put it in here. Um, but the only thing to remember is
you've, sorry, you've anti-symmetrized over everything now. So one of the obvious things is that if any leg of, mu of rho has a leg in common with omega, this will give you zero, because you'll, right, it's only keeping the anti-symmetric stuff. And that means it only keeps the stuff that's completely different. dx1, which dx1 is zero by construction. Okay. And in fact, it's a, not too hard to see that the wedge product is anti-symmetric if both omega and rho are odd. If either one is even, then it's going to be a symmetric product because it'll involve swapping an even number of minus sets. OK, so these things naturally appear. They're going to naturally appear in supergravity. Uh, and they're naturally appearing in, in the um, Philbein formulation. But the reason they naturally appear in a way is because they, they, they have their own notion of covariant derivative. Let me not say covariant derivative. They have their own notion of derivative. It's called the exterior derivative. And that's simply the following. D omega, well, you hit it with a partial derivative. That gives you one more index. And then you anti-symmetrize over all of them. So if I call that nu, and then I just, well, I will just write it like this. You just put the wedge product here. And this is now uh, r plus 1 form. I haven't written it, but I could put anti-symmetrized here. It's automatic, because this, the wedge product enforces anti-symmetrization. So in components, um, you have it's just uh, the derivative. You, you just anti-symmetrize. You take the derivative of one index and then anti-symmetrize over, over all of them. Now, the cheap way to see this is a good idea is go back to what you know about geometry and how you would define a covariant derivative on a manifold. Remember you, when you first learned GR or whatever, you spent hours trying to figure out this Christoffel symbol and all, how it worked and all this, uh, yeah, how ugly it was. But yes, it does what it wants, what you want it to do. If I, wanted, if, if I was in a course uh, just thinking about this as a generic tensor, I would put a covariant derivative here and I'd put my Christoffel symbols in here all over the place. And, I'd, and, you, and you'd be convinced that that was, a, that was fine. That's going to be diffeomorphism invariant. You can do that here, too. The point is, because it's anti-symmetrized, the Christoffel terms will all drop out. Yeah? You, you gain nothing by adding Christoffel symbols in here and changing this to covariant derivatives, and hence making it look like a covariant object. This thing is covariant as is. If I do a coordinate transformation, change of variables, these change too, of course, and these change in the opposite way, and this is going to be invariant. And I don't have to have the Christoffel symbols because they will they cancel out. All right, has everyone signed this out? Ah. Are you, are you assuming no torsion then? Yeah. So we're going to set torsion to, well, no, it, I, I, I'm assuming no torsion, but it doesn't matter. It's still going to be a diffeomorphism invariant, even if there's torsion. OK. So if you have these, and so you, you can think of these things as just anti-symmetric tensors, all of whose indices are downstairs. It's a special class of tensor for which you have, you, basically, you don't need to define the, the Levi-Civita derivative for them. So you take their wedge product. So that would take a, an, an R form and an S form, and that would give you an R plus S form. Or you can take their exterior derivative, d omega, and that gives you an R plus 1 form. And it's also easy to see that this satisfies a very beautiful equation, which is d d omega equals 0, d squared omega equals 0. And the reason is, if I take another derivative here, 
I'm going to get something that's symmetric in its indices, and so when I anti-symmetrize it, it just drops off. So this is a very profound and deep equation, d squared equals zero. It, it's the basis of so many things, cohomology. Um, but it, it rises here. I say, I say this because it, it still astounds me. Like it, it, supergravity is, is like physics on stero you know, just physics intuition. And it picks up all these profound ideas. OK, I haven't told you yet why this is deep, but eventually we will mention the word Calabi-Yau, and that in here, this is, becomes highly non-trivial, and that's all because of this rather naive reasoning about just wanting to make gravity supersymmetric. Okay. There's one last thing that you can do with forms uh, that's very useful. So the other important thing to mention, at this stage, I haven't introduced a metric. Yeah. So this is a nice diffeomorphism invariant thing. If I wrote this as a, as a tensor, it would just be the total anti-symmetrized. And I told you, yes, you could write that with the Levi-Civita derivative, but the Christoffel symbols would drop out. Um, so far, this is all defined without any reference to a metric. It's just a form. And uh, you can take its derivative. And you don't need to know uh, a connection for it, and hence, or say, a Levi-Civita connection, which, which you'd get from a metric. But there is one operation that does this important operation, which is called the Hodge dual, which does require a metric. Hodge star, Hodge dual. So here you need a metric. If you have a metric, which of course we will, then we can define star omega, which is now going to be a d minus r form. So if omega here is an r form, the Hodge dual is a d minus r form. And it's got a 1 over r factorial. It's got the square root of the determinant of the metric, the absolute value, because we'll be uh, Lorentzian, it'll be negative. Then it's got this epsilon symbol, nu1 to nu r, and then mu1, no, sorry, mu r plus 1 to mu d. So you use the fact that you have this epsilon symbol, which is totally anti-symmetric, right? It's the thing. And this epsilon, by the way, uh, is such that in my conventions, upstairs is 1. So well, I'm taking this definition for epsilon. If it's got a curly, yeah. there's no metric component in here. It's just, it's just a numerical object. So I've got epsilon here. Uh, now this is, so I need the metric here, but I also need the metric here to raise these indices. So mu uh, r plus 1, lambda r plus 1, dot, 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 all the way to, I should have written this over there, um, mu d lambda d. And then you just put your form in here. You've, so you've raised it. You've raised all the indices. Uh, lambda r plus 1 dot, dot, dot to lambda d. So you take your form. You raise all the indices using the metric. You can track that into the epsilon symbol, multiply by the determinant g, and that gives you another form. And that's called the Hodge dual. So this requires a metric. OK. So the last thing we want to do, maybe, is integrate these things.
So it's, it's, if you like, it's a definition, but we can integrate a D form on a D manifold, D dimensional manifold. And it's simply the following, the definition, if you like, the integral of omega over a manifold. Well, this is, by definition, it's a D form. So I'm just writing out what that D form is. And then the definition is simply this. The normal, you take that the one component is a top form, so it's only got one component, meaning there's only one possible anti-symmetric thing with, with the indices. You take that guy and you just integrate it like you'd integrate anything. So that's how you can integrate forms. And then there's a natural inner product. Two forms of the same degree. So these are both R forms. You integrate star omega wedge row. And if you want a little exercise, if you go back to electromagnetism, electromagnetism has a one form. It's never, it may not have been written that way, but you have an A mu. So there's a one form A mu dx mu, right? It has an exterior derivative dA, which is going to be d nu A mu, and then it's minus d mu A nu, if you like, antisymmetrized. I put a, a half in here. What I've done, well, then maybe I shouldn't. That was a bit too fast. The way I defined it was this is d nu a mu dx nu, which dx mu. And now I'm going to just put the half in. Sorry. Because it's anti-symmetric, I'm just uh, explicitly doing the anti-symmetrization. Yeah? That's allowed. And now you should recognize this. And I'm just swapping the indices again. F mu nu, dx mu, and df nu. The, Mac, the Faraday tensor. All the places to mention the name Faraday tensor. Uh, this is a pleasure. So that's the Faraday tensor, and it just comes from the exterior derivative of the, the gauge field, the photon field. Well, you might want to convince yourself that the following is true. Integral of star f wedge f is minus, there's a one half out front, f mu nu f mu nu uh, d dx. Or more to, yeah. dA wedge, star dA wedge dA equals that. Yeah. So this was our lightning tour of forms. Either you knew it already, or it's probably a complete mystery. Um, my experience with forms is you just you, familiarity leads to understanding. <laughs> you just use them a lot, manipulate them a lot, and uh, then it's all much better. But at the first time, it can it can seem like that they're not useful. They're just weird, um, but actually they're beautiful. So one of the things that, for example, is important. It's a, yeah, I could have written all this out without having differential forms, right? 
I, why did I need differential forms to write f mu nu, f mu nu? <laughs> you could have told me that that was a, a, a good scalar thing to write down. But I wanted to write it down like this. Well, these kind of forms with higher, higher than two forms, higher R forms, appear all over supergravity. And they have a similar structure. But rather than having a two index object, you might have a four index object. But the other thing I like about forms, well, not just me, I'm sure, is it makes it very clear what is depending upon a metric and what isn't. So if you see the Hodge dual, that requires knowing the metric. If you don't have a Hodge dual, that means that what you've written down, if it's an action principle, it doesn't depend on the metric, and so it's topological. So, for example, in 4D, you have integral of uh, f wedge star f, or star f wedge f. Whether or not you can put the star to the other side depends on the dimensions. But there's some kind of uh, relation. I, I, yeah. I should also have said, by the way, that there is a simple star squared. It's plus or minus 1. If you take the Hodge dual and do it twice, you get back. And the sign depends on the signature of spacetime and the dimension of spacetime and the, sign of the dimension of your form, the rank of your form. So I don't remember the formula there, um, but there is one. And similarly, whether you have this, sorry, uh, omega wedge rho, this again is also up to sign, like that. And the, the sign depends on various things. So in 4D, you might have an action that looks, that's the Maxwell type action, which of course you could turn into non-abelian. Um, this involves the metric. But in four dimensions, you can also, and maybe there's a 1 over g squared here. And then here, that might be theta over 4 pi. But you can also write that, because this is a two form. A two form which a two form is not 0. A one form which a one form itself is 0, but not two form. Uh, that's a four form, so I can integrate it over four manifolds. So here's an action. Maxwell theory with a theta angle, or, or if I put a trace in front, it's Yang-Mills. And this is dynamical. This has talks to the metric. This is topological. It doesn't know anything about the metric on, on, on your manifold. OK. So that was our digression into forms. I will use them a little bit. And so you know, feel free to uh, interrupt me if it's too fast. Or Like I said, just yawn very loudly if it's too slow. All right, so let's return to our fermions. That was our point. Spinners. I mean, they're anti-symmetric, but really, the fact that they're anti-commuting is a, is, a, is a physics thing. From a math perspective, they are spinners. All right, we, we have the following. Gamma mu underlined. Gamma nu underlined equals 2 eta nu nu underlined. This is the normal gamma matrices that we were using before. I didn't put an underline on them because we didn't have that concept. But this is a Minkowski space. These are just constants. Constant matrices. D by over 2 by. And you pick them like you would have picked them before. You, know, you take your favorite representation of the gamma matrices. And there you go. The object you want now is gamma mu, which is E mu nu gamma nu. That now is a space-time dependent matrix. But it's pretty easy to see that this Because these are just numbers, they they come out of the matrix product, and that's eta rho lambda, e mu rho, 
e nu lambda, and so this is indeed g mu nu. So these are the, the gammas that you use on your space-time. So now we're finally in a position to write down a covariant derivative d mu on a spinner is d mu on that spinner plus one quarter well, let me go down omega mu lambda rho gamma lambda rho psi So that's how we're going to define the derivative of a fermion. So the fermions, if you like, they live in the tangent space. The tangent, well, they live in the spinner bundle. But um, they're not really sitting on the manifold per se. You pull them, they, they live in more in this, well, they live in the spin bundle, which is closely related to the tangent bundle. Yeah. Eta. Eta. Very good question. So eta, so the mu, the mu, the underlined indices are, are, are just special relativity indices. And they're raised and lower using eta. The mu nu indices, which are called world indices, are raised and lowered using mu. Sorry, using g. OK. So if you want a little exercise, um, Show that if a mu happens to be psi bar gamma mu psi, that's just some bi spinner that you've made a vector out of, then d mu psi bar gamma nu psi plus psi bar gamma mu d nu psi. So I'm just taking the derivative of the right-hand side. And these are constant in this language. Because, yeah, th these guys become constant because the e's are coherently constant. Um, well, you can check it out. These won't. You can verify that for yourself. This is just going to give you d mu a nu minus gamma mu nu sigma a sigma. So in other words, this definition of a covariant derivative acting on spinners, combined with this other stuff we know about Feerbeins, means that if I take the covariant derivative of the right-hand side, I get what I would expect to get for what I know in geometry. Yeah? Gamma is a linear? What? I don't, they pull out of the derivative. Why are they covariantly constants? Yes. I, well, it, I think the following is true, but it's just. So I defined it. Let me just make sure. Well, d nu. So this is covariantly constant. And this is constant, right? So how am I going to even define this? Um, well, you certainly would have this. Oh, that's the wrong index. I don't even know what you would. <laughs> OK. I don't know what, yeah. Gammas are just constant. They're sitting in your tangent space, and uh, they're fixed for all times in your convention. They don't change. OK. The next thing is to uh, co curvature. This gives us a new definition of curvature.
So you know how you define it normally in, to, in terms of the Christoffel symbols. This is going to give us a new way to define curvature entirely in terms of the omegas. You just work out what this is. All right? This is the usual thing you might do. Um, Sorry. So this is the D mu hitting that. This is uh, the D mu hitting that. There is the, OK, I'll do this term. Oops. D mu hitting that. Um, now I've got this, the spin connection guy in here. So that's. That and then in here there's going to be like a one over sixteen. Um, okay, and if you want, and this is a moot point, you might say, "Oh, I have to add in this guy." Okay, and then minus mu interchange new. So the point of all this. Just like it always is, um, many terms cancel. This is symmetric under mu interchange nu. So is this term. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's just some big matrix times itself, and then anti-symmetrized. And these terms are to pairwise symmetric, and this is symmetric. I mean, that's yeah, symmetric. So you're just left with one quarter d mu omega nu lambda rho minus d nu omega mu lambda rho. Um, yeah. Oh, I lied. This isn't quite symmetric. I'm sorry, I, I, I was too quick there. That's, that's going to require a little bit of work. So let me, let, me, uh, let me get my eraser out of my iPad here and... This is not quite. We'll have to have that in a second. Sorry. Uh, so we've got these terms and this thing. All right. Uh, where can I, I can try it over here. So I've got the following thing, this term. So this is where we're going to do some hardcore gammas, which is something my, me and my students love. OK. So you have this. Uh, what it? Uh, sigma tau lambda rho. That's the thing that I did too quickly. So now I have to write these out. So here's a bit of gamma matrix fun. So gamma matrix multiplication, which you will be doing a lot of if you do supergravity. There's some things to remember. Remember, everything's, these things are anti-symmetrized. So when you multiply them out, the first term you get is where they're all different, and they just get the four indexes, right? So a gamma matrix with, with two indices, it's anti-symmetrized in those two indices, yeah? You know that. I should have said that, but that's the convention. So it means that basically, it's, if their indices are different, gamma mu nu is gamma mu gamma nu if mu is not equal to nu and zero otherwise. So this guy, well, if they're all different, it's just the product, so it's fine. But then you have to worry about what if, if, if 
one of these is equal to one of those? Well, you're going to get, um, for example, e to nu tau, and then a gamma this term. Now, they come in different symmetries, so we actually are going to get 2 times 2, terms like that. So what I mean is these, these guys are anti-symmetrized in sigma and tau on the left, and they're anti-symmetrized in lambda and rho. That's automatic. So I'm being a bit shorthanded, but if you want, you can write it all out. But you're going to get four such terms, because the tau could equal the lambda, or the tau could equal to the rho, or the sigma could equal the lambda, or the sigma could equal to the rho. So there's four possible ways one of these guys could be equal one of those guys. So that's the 2 times 2. And I've picked the one example, which is tau lambda. This guy hits that guy, and they cancel off. And then I get sigma rho, sigma rho. But this is actually only representative of four possible terms, all of which differ by different symmetrizations of sigma and tau lambda and rho. So they all contribute the same. Are you OK with that? Doing it quickly. Well, like, Yes, it's the same calculation. And then the last thing is where both of these are equal to both of those. And there's only one, there's only, well, two ways to do that. Tau could equal lambda and sigma equals rho. So those are the, and again, this, this, well, this is correct because the anti-symmetrization that I needed to write out is being absorbed by here, by these guys. Please, we will be doing a few of this a few, this a few times. So if you're not happy, come talk to me. We'll just, uh... But here's the point. This guy would be symmetric now, as is this one, but not that one, under mu interchange nu. Yeah? Because mu interchange nu is the same as swapping sigma tau as a pair with lambda rho as a pair, and they will just commute through. So that's symmetric. And here it's kind of obvious that it's symmetric. So this last term that I, I accidentally rubbed off, well, what do you get? You get a factor of um, 4, because this is 2, and then I have to subtract off mu interchange nu. So that gives me another factor of 4, another factor of 2. So that gives me uh, a factor of 4. So that gives me a quarter. So here I am with right 4 over 16. And then what you get here, then, is just uh, Uh, I'll take me omega out, omega mu, and then there's one contraction. So it's going to be omega mu tau lambda, yeah, omega nu uh, lambda rho sigma tau rho. Um, sorry. And then mine, sorry, I, I got confused. It's this guy that we got. So there's a factor of 4, and then I have to do minus mu interchange nu. Sorry. My writing's got so bad at this point, I could probably write down anything and you'd believe it. Uh, tau. So this is what you get. The key point is, as before, it only depends on psi. The derivative terms have gone away. So you would define this to be, but even better than that, oh, I've missed many things here. Sorry. I missed that term. But this is of this form. Yeah? It just involves the two gammas hitting on the psi. And the, this defines the curvature tensor from a spin connection point of view. So we have Plus, yeah. So 
So that's our, our spin connection. And if we know forms, which we do know now, you can think of this as a two-form. So in form language, it's quite simple. This is a nicer way, I think, of thinking about curvature tensor than the Riemann tensor, because uh, it's, it's much more like a gauge theory. This is a two-form, taking values in the Lie algebra. The local, uh, Lie algebra is of, of local Lorentz transformations in the spinner bundle. Or, yeah. um, and it's, of course, it's anti-symmetric when you raise and lower the underlined indices, because that's what it means to be in the Lie algebra of SO1 d minus 2. And it's anti-symmetric in the two world line indices, because by construction, it's anti-symmetric in these two indices. But that means it's a form. And it's a two-form that takes values in this Lie algebra. Now, it's also not surprising that R mu nu uh, lambda rho, which would be E lambda sigma bar E um, rho tau times R mu nu sigma tau. If I, this is the ordinary fellow you're used to. And again, I leave it to you to convince yourself that that's the case. And, and, and the hint is just think about this. Think about that guy, where A was what I wrote down before. And then you'll see that it has to agree. OK, I guess it's, it's probably a good place to stop. I didn't get as, quite as far, but not too bad. Um, I'm writing down the supergravity. But we, we now have all the ingredients we need to write down the supergravity. Um, yeah, so the other nice tense, the things we know about the Riemann tensor, like if you swap the two sets of indices, that's not apparent over here. That's something that's special to the Riemann tensor. Um, and it's certainly still true. Okay, shall we, there's pizza, so I better not, I gotta shut up.